Hello, everybody. Andy Jacob here with the dot-com magazine entrepreneur spotlight series. Wow. I have a great show today. You know, everybody knows who watches the show that I'm originally from Detroit, Michigan. And one thing when I was growing up, you know, that I did quite often, I went over the, you know, the border to, to Canada and spent a lot of time there. I have a lot of friends in Canada. Of course, I'm a big hockey fan and not only that, but wow, we've been interviewing so many interesting entrepreneurs from Canada. So, of course, it came across my desk very, very recently that there's an organization, a council, that's doing such great work between Canada and America that we had to bring the CEO on the show. Her name is Scotty Greenwood, and she's the CEO of the Canadian American Business Council, and they're doing such great work. I mean, the United States and Canada, I mean, we're really facing the world's challenges together. And Scotty's right in the middle of it with this council. And of course, my background and experience and the people I know in Canada, my love of hockey, and then all the entrepreneurs, I said, hey, let's bring Scotty on the show and get into what she's doing because she has a world-class model for nations everywhere. So Scotty, welcome to the Dotcom Magazine Entrepreneur Spotlight Series today. Thank you so much, Andy. It's so good to be with you. And it's so good to hear your enthusiasm about hockey and Detroit and all things Canada-US. You know, this Canada-US relationship is the most prosperous commercial relationship in the history of the world. It's $700 billion a year that we do business with each other. We're each other's biggest customer, biggest partner, biggest investor. And so it's only natural that uh, we would celebrate that. And I'm so thrilled uh, to join with you to talk about all the great things that our countries do together. I love it, Scott. And of course, we've had so many Canadian entrepreneurs on the show, and they're doing such great work throughout North America. I mean, they love, you know, uh, getting their products and services in, into, you know, the United States. They help people in Canada. Then, of course, there's so many people in the United States that are delivering products and services to Canada as well. So let's get into it. Before we get started, I mean, this is such a great subject. Let's pull the lens back to 30,000 feet. Tell us about the Canadian American Business Council, and then we'll get into it. Sounds good, Andy. Thanks a lot. So the Canadian American Business Council has been around for 34 years. Uh, I've been involved with it for about the last 20, so not since the beginning. But uh, the purpose of it at the time uh, was to promote, to be a cheerleader for free trade. You know, uh, the U.S. and Canada were negotiating trade agreements, a trade agreement with each other, and there were a lot of naysayers. There were a lot of nationalists. People said, you know, let's be self-sufficient. We don't need anybody else. And at the time, way back then, uh, the Canadian embassy said to itself, well, where are the champions? Where are the people that, you know, we know business is going to benefit from being able to have a tariff-free zone with each other. Where are those voices? We don't see them. So, so the Canadian embassy in Washington, D.C. actually at the time said, we need to get some businesses together. And that was, that was the beginning spark. And as we've seen, um, it's not perfect. No relationship of any kind is perfect, but it's pretty successful and it's done well. Canada and the United States have done well with each other. We've, we not only had the Canada-US trade agreement, but then we added Mexico to that, it became North American. And then just a couple of years ago, we updated that agreement uh, to what's now known as the USMCA. Sounds kind of wonky, but what it means is our businesses and our citizens and our people can do business with each other uh, without encountering barriers to trade. And that is incredibly important to the bottom line for all of us. Yeah, I love it so much that free trade is so important. Of course, President Harry S. Truman said that Canada's relationship with the United States was compounded on one part proximity and nine parts goodwill and common sense. And I love that so much. Let's talk about it a little bit. So, so what's your day look like? I mean, are you talking to organizations? Are you talking to both governments? What does the CABC do on a daily basis to make sure that this relationship between our two nations really works in a powerful way? Well, at the heart of it, we convene people. We convene business leaders and political leaders, government leaders to have dialogue. Sometimes that's in a big public forum. We hosted Prime Minister Trudeau when he was in Washington a couple of months ago. Oftentimes, though, it's it's behind closed doors and it's to be have a very frank conversation so that, you know, politicians 
God bless them. They don't always know what it's like to be here in the private sector. And likewise, uh, business leaders don't always appreciate the political pressures, the governmental constraints that are on our leaders. So we bring people together. So as an example, um, in January of this year, uh, when we knew that there, there were going to be vaccine mandates put on truckers for the first time going back and forth across our border, you know, we got in touch or actually the White House got in touch with us and said, do we need to be worried about impact on supply chain? What's going to happen with the truckers? This was in January. What happened a few months later, of course, was a was a trucker convoy uh, that was a political statement. And it, we didn't get involved until they blocked that ambassador bridge crossing. Andy, right where you were from, Detroit, Windsor, you know, that's the busiest border crossing in the world commercially. Uh, and that's a vital lifeline, not only for the auto sector, but fresh produce and uh, so many other parts of manufacturing. So we got involved in that and said, okay, look at governments, you have got to do whatever is necessary to make sure that our borders remain open to each other because people's livelihoods depend on it. So our day-to-day -day is different every day, but at the heart of it, it's convening really meaningful conversations um, and insights between private sector leaders from both countries and policymakers from both countries. Yeah, it's so powerful. I've been across that Ambassador Bridge, you know, a hundred times in my lifetime or more. Let's talk a little bit about what you just mentioned, Scotty, because it's so interesting. You know, you said that oftentimes people in government, they don't understand sort of the entrepreneurial journey. And then the entrepreneurs themselves or the business leaders, they don't understand sort of sometimes the in intricacies of what's happening in the government. What's the big thing that you feel that the government doesn't understand about entrepreneurs? And likewise, what's the big thing that entrepreneurs don't understand about the government? Well, you know, anytime decisions are made in a vacuum, it's a risk, right? And so one of the things that we see governments doing is making decisions that affect the livelihoods of people in business, but they haven't talked to business. So, you know, a small difference in a, in a regulation, a small difference in the way a Canadian department says you've got to label your product could cost a business, you know, millions and millions and hundreds of millions of dollars. And if they had only talked to, to the people involved, uh, they would understand, well, maybe there's a way we could uh, make this more straightforward, or maybe we could harmonize across jurisdictions. So I think it's just really getting a real sense of that. In terms of the other way, what, what do business businesses need to understand about government is we really don't love the fact that politics exists, right? Like we all wish we could just, everybody could just do their job and there was no politics. But the truth is there are political realities that constrain the way governments govern. And so getting a little sense of what are the realities that govern, what are, you know, this member of Congress, she's got to get reelected later this year. So what's on her mind? It's not just how to make your business go smoother, but it's also how to serve her constituents, just as an example. So having that back and forth where, you know, we, we walk a mile in each other's moccasins, if you will, um, we, we illuminate sort of the other side of the table. I think, I think it helps. I know it helps. Um, and, it's, and it's the underpinning for what is really a very successful bilateral relationship. Yeah, it's so powerful. Of course, at the CABC, you're really the leading nonprofit, nonpartisan, issues oriented organization, really dedicated to fostering this dialogue uh, between the public and private sectors. When we look at the U.S. government, are there, you know, for, because there's a lot of people watching the show, we're so busy in our entrepreneurial journey, we're not really thinking so much about what goes on in the government. Are there certain go to people that are really responsible for the relationship with Canada and for the relationship with other countries? Well, you know, it depends on, it depends on the sector you're talking about. So the answer is yes, there is. So in Congress, there's something called the Northern Border Caucus. So these are members of Congress that live along our northern border. Congressman Brian Higgins is, is a very active member. He's a co-chair of that caucus. And so when the border closed during the pandemic, when it closed to discretionary travel, there were families that were cut off from each other, that there were businesses that were deemed for some reason to not be essential by their governments. And so you had Congressman Brian Higgins and Congresswoman Susan Delbany and all of these members of the Northern Border Caucus that would bang 
on the White House and bang on the Department of Homeland Security and say, look, at it. we have to figure out a better way to do this. So you've got the Congressional Northern Border Caucus. But then also, depending on what sector you're in, there's a different agency or a different person uh, responsible for what you do. I would say in the energy sector, as an example, people look at U.S. Senator Joe Manchin. He's from West Virginia. He has he's on the relevant committees. He has a lot. He's a centrist. Right. And he has a lot to say about uh, this energy world, energy intensive world that we're in. So it kind of depends on your sector, uh, who you rely on. And and again, that we try to connect people with their leaders, um, both in business and in, and in government. Yeah, I love it. I would imagine you're on the speed dial with so many people in the legislation and media and, of course, business figures. Let's talk about something at a high level, Scotty, because obviously what you do at CABC, you and your team, I mean, you're experts at really bringing people together, having them communicate effectively and come out the other end, hopefully with something that really flowers for both parties, the governments and sort of the the, the for-profit businesses. What's the number one thing? And I think everybody could learn from this about communication. What's the number one thing to get people to start communicating and talking and understanding each other? You know, I think it's authenticity. And, uh, you know, communications today are really challenged, right? People think about their sources of information and they question the validity of information and people listen to their own, they're in their own media bubbles, they're in their own media, you know, streams. And so trying to figure out what's true, what's real news, what's fake news, what's authentic. That's, uh, I think that's the biggest challenge. And I think just being, I think being really straightforward and transparent about what you're, what you're talking about. I'll, I'll give you an example, Andy. One of our projects in the last year has been, we, you know, like everybody else, we came up with a podcast. And uh, our podcast is, uh, it's called Canusa Street, C-A-N-U-S-A Street. Um, and it's with, it's a project of ours at the Canadian American Business Council, along with, with the Woodrow Wilson Center for Scholars, which is this presidential library. They've got a brilliant group of, uh, of scholars over there. Chris Sands, who is my co co-host on Canusa Street leads their Canada Institute. And so what we do just as an example in communications on Canusa Street is we bring a variety of voices together to talk about a Canada US issue. Cause sometimes it's not private sector versus government. Sometimes it's US versus Canada or sometimes it's West Coast versus East Coast. So we will bring in, in an effort to have authentic voices at the table, we bring experts together. And also we want to explain issues that uh, maybe people haven't focused on. So we have a couple of episodes on the oldest trade dispute, I think in our country's history, which is softwood lumber. Super boring, unless either you're in the industry or you're worried about housing prices or, uh, or if that trade dispute as between the countries gets in the way of your business, then you're interested. So we talk about softwood lumber. We talk about, in another episode, the Columbia River Treaty. Uh, and we bring in the Canadian negotiator, the U.S. negotiator, somebody who speaks for tribes, somebody who speaks for uh, regular people. So that's our approach, Andy, is to try to be real, you know, and People can judge for themselves whether they agree, whether they disagree, whether they want to jump into the fray. But that's, I, I think that's how we uh, we approach our communication strategy. We also try to, we try to play on all the different platforms, maybe except for TikTok. I'm leaving that to uh, to the kids. I don't know how to I don't know how to get into TikTok in a in a serious way. Uh, but uh, but we're you know we we are present um, on on LinkedIn and on social media, and we we do have a fairly active um, diaspora between Canada and the United States and, and 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 around the world now. The the other thing I'll add is is when there is a big global issue. Um, if, if our members think that we have something, a voice that, that is relevant, we get into that. So we have a, um, a series on corporate action on social justice. And we, we just had a, a podcast series um, on Ukraine, on the war in Ukraine. And it's about what are Canada and the United States doing? So we, we, uh, we, cover, we cover the waterfront, I will say that. You cover it all, of course. I'm looking at maybe potentially building a home. So of course, I'm interested in lumber prices and I didn't think about it, how important Canada is. So I'm going to have to listen to the Canusa Street podcast. I mean, that sounds like a very interesting episode. 
when we think about it and we look at what you do, Scotty, and you're doing such an amazing job. I mean, everybody knows in the business, you know, at the governmental agencies, what, you know, the Canadian American Business Council is all about. Where do you spend your time? Is it is it now all done electronically on Zoom or are you in Washington? Are you up in Canada? Where are you moving around these days to bring all these people together? Well, I, li- I live in Washington, D.C., and uh, and before the pandemic, I, I commuted to Canada a- almost weekly to different parts, and Canada is a giant uh, geography, and I was traveling through five different time zones, you know, to get to different places. Um, during the pandemic, of course, everyone um, started meeting virtually. We got we got pretty good at that, um, and it's efficient, you know, um, but, but you really miss something in not breaking bread together, you know, and not showing up in person. There's something about body language. There's something about just that human connection that's important. So we do try to convene in person. Um, our board is meeting for our first in-person meeting in a couple of years. We're going to meet in New York City. Uh, we're hosted, the chair of our board happens to be from MasterCard. And uh, she's she and her colleagues at MasterCard Corporate are, are going to are going to host us. And I really look forward to that. You know, New York was hit really hard, especially hard uh, during, during the pandemic. And, uh, and so it's, it's also good to show up and support communities and, you know, um, book a few hotel rooms and have a few meals and, uh, you know, uh, get, get back together again. So, so we do a lot of, a lot of both. Um, we really do believe in showing up in person. Um, I, we've got board members and members of our entrepreneur circle, which is a new feature that we have that have never met each other. Imagine that that's that we wouldn't have heard of that a couple of years ago. And so we're going to, we're going to fix that when it's uh, safe and responsible to do so hopefully in the coming months. I love it. Of course, you mentioned something about south of the border, south of the American border. You have the south of the Canadian border, now south of the American border. There's a lot of interesting and exciting, you know, entrepreneurs south of the American border, you know, in Mexico and Latin America. Um, how, do, how does the Latin America, Mexico sort of trade, um, how does it flow into what you do with the U.S. and Canadian trade? You know, because of this North American trade agreement that we have, and it's it's really the the, the biggest, most serious free trade area in the world um, that the United States takes part in. Um, Mexico is a key part of that, and Mexico um, has such a huge and vibrant economy. It has different challenges from a governance point of view. I think we have to be realistic about that, but Mexico has really. Um, been a key part of really, for example, the manufacturing sector. Um, so, so autos are now made, parts and pieces of autos um, are made, are sourced around the world, but they're really made in, in all three countries. And so um, we see that as, as a very important part of the future. We're Canada US focused, of course, but we recognize the important role that Mexico plays and you know the rest of the Americas. It's, I, I will say this, with supply chains being what they are, with inflation being what it is, Having things closer to home matters. So near shoring, ally shoring, not having to go across an ocean um, to source your parts is important. And so I think the Americas uh, will play more and more as a team uh, with each other, kind of vis-a-vis our global competitors. At least I hope so. We're, we're hoping for that. Um, and, and Mexico is, is a key to all of that. Yeah, it's very interesting. Now, of course, recently, I interviewed a great entrepreneur. She's, she has an energy bar. She's in Canada. She sells about one to one and a half million energy bars throughout North America a month. And I'm thinking wow. to myself, you know, how did she get it from, you know, her kitchen table in Canada all the way throughout North America, all in the United States? And I would imagine that if you go back to the genesis, I would imagine that the Canadian American Business Council probably at some point along the way had something to do with that success of her. So that's really great. Well, I, I don't know if we directly did, but but at least putting together the conditions um, so that entrepreneurs and business people and farmers and ranchers can 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 have a friction free interaction across the border. That's uh, that's our wheelhouse. So hopefully, hopefully we at least help in a small way. And, and the other thing is. When, when tensions do arise, when there are problems, we're there to try to help advocate for untangling them. So hopefully it's friction-free and she sells her energy bars all around the world, starting you know, in Canada, the United States and Mexico, and then, and then the world. But, uh, but if, 
if she were to run into a problem, uh, every once in a while, we're able to help untangle problems too. Not every time, but you know, we try our best. It's so awesome. If I'm an entrepreneur in Canada or an entrepreneur in America and, you know, in the United States, and I want to do business, if I'm the American and I want to do business in Canada, or if I'm the Canadian wanting to do business in America, who's my go-to for questions regarding how to get my product or service into the other country? Is yeah. it CABC or do you have a group of like attorneys and consultants they can talk with? Well, both. And, and there's also both countries have um, trade commissioners and people don't realize this, but Canada has, I think, 13 or 14 consulates in the United States. So L.A., Denver, Seattle, Chicago, Dallas, Atlanta, uh, et cetera. And each one of those consulates has somebody whose job it is to help promote Canadian business in the U.S., Likewise, the other way, um, the U.S. has these folks in Canada. It's called the Commercial Service. It's part of our Department of Commerce. So sometimes what we do at the Canadian American Business Council is we connect people to a- actually officials who love to hear back home. Like it's people don't often think of their government as being here to help. And uh, and every once in a while, especially in the in the instance of trade commissioners and foreign commercial service, uh, governments actually do open doors. They can host you know, uh, events, uh, summits, meetups, things like that in the other in the other market. The other thing, though, Andy, and is, you know, in Canada, United States, we're really pretty regional. So if you live in the Pacific Northwest, Washington and Oregon are really connected with British Columbia in a way they're not necessarily connected here. The Great Lakes, same thing. Ontario is quite connected with Michigan. And so there's a lot of natural interaction that occurs um, in regions right across that border that that doesn't occur otherwise. Now, if you're in the South, if you're in Florida or Arizona, you you come across Canadians because they're snowbirds, because it's really cold up there in the winter. And so people that are looking for some sunshine and vitamin D often will, uh, will come South in very big numbers and they invest. Uh, so, so that it, depending on where you live, depends on how you interact with the other country. It's such a great relationship, Scotty. Now you're a nonprofit. So let's talk about that. We're the CABC, we're a nonprofit. What does that mean? I mean, where does the money come from to make sure the CABC is so relevant with what's going on between Canada and the United States? Yeah, so we we are supported by some very generous members. And so members of the Canadian American Business Council, they pay dues and they underwrite events. And they're all brands that you've heard of. Uh, so whether it's Lockheed Martin, whether it's Google, whether in Canada, TD or CN, uh, Walmart, uh, it's, it's, all, it's all big, important brands that believe in their civic responsibility and believe in our mission and promoting the importance of the Canada-U.S. relationship. So uh, that's that's where the money comes from, and it all goes towards our mission. So every year uh, we break even. <laughs> Hopefully, we break even, and uh, uh, we have we have very uh, very strong members that uh, that make sure that we're able to do what we need to do on both sides of the border. So it's member driven. It's like a chamber of commerce. Yeah, it's so great, Scotty. You do such great work. And of course, you know, when we think about the United States and Canada, we think about, you know, your organization sort of being at the forefront to make sure that the two countries face the world's challenges together. And I love that so much. Let's talk about team. I mean, what's the team look like at your nonprofit? What's the team structure? How do you build your team? What's it look like from the inside out? Sure. So, um, so we provide, we have a secretariat model. So I have a consulting firm called Crestview, Crestview Strategy. And uh, Canadian American Business Council is an important client of Crestview Strategy. And so when I need people to help, for example, we have the Canadian American Business Council has something called the North American Rebound Campaign. And it's this idea, people can look at it, NorthAmericanRebound.com. And it's this idea that as we come out of this recovery in North America, we're in it together. Let's not compete against each other. Let's, let's, uh, let's help each other recover economically. That rebound campaign is staffed by some, uh, some of my colleagues in Toronto. Their job is to be uh, the, the arms and legs of that digital campaign engagement. And they're in Toronto, but it's a, but it's a continental effort. Um, we also have 
colleagues that will engage on projects. So there's a wonderful colleague of mine, Virginia Beckett. She's got an events company. Uh, we used to work directly together. And then she said, you know what? Of all the things we do, I really like special events. So she started her own events company. And so when I need uh, somebody to help organize an event and I need, and I need um, an extra, uh, extra help, I call on Virginia. And so she put together, for example, a dinner in a yurt on the side of a mountain in Montana last summer, Andy, and it was fabulous. Um, and it was Canadian and American legislators coming together. And so Virginia is a key part of, we're, we're hosting an event for the Canadian defense attache when he retires and Virginia is handling that. So, so we have, uh, we have people that come in um, on a gig basis, like, my, you know, like you're putting together a movie and you get the caterers, you get the makeup artists, you get the uh, stunt people, you get the, you know, the camera crew, the lighting and all that for one particular location, you put together the movie and then it's different for a different project. So that's that's kind of the way we operate. My There is a director of operations uh, for the council, Chelsea McEntee. She's up in Ontario. She's spectacular. She works on this all day, every day. But we have, you know, we have congressional outreach, parliamentary outreach. Uh, we have operations and uh, and then we have media. So that's that's kind of how we think about it. I love it. And for the entrepreneurs watching the show, rewind what Scotty just said. I mean, she has her go-to people and she has people that she trusts. And when something needs to happen, she goes to her trusted advisors, to her, her trusted Rolodex, and they get the job done. And that's always great for entrepreneurs to have that trusted Rolodex because they're really an extension of your business. And if used properly, it's a great way to grow and it's a great way to provide the superior service that your clients both expect and deserve. It's fantastic. Now, Scotty, let's talk a little bit about entrepreneurship because you know, you mentioned it a little bit. It's not always smooth sailing between you know, Canada and the United States. Sometimes there's some hiccups. Sometimes there's bumps in the road. For the younger entrepreneurs watching the show that are maybe having a hiccup in their business, or maybe they're having a pothole in the road in their business, I'm hoping based on your experience between working with the two countries, you can share some information with the younger entrepreneurs watching the show about what it takes to get through a tough time in business? Yeah, great, great question. And I, I think the first thing is to just have confidence that it's all going to be okay. You know, like nobody wants to fail, but I think entrepreneurs, people who are entrepreneurial are brave. And I mean, we all fail and that's, you just learn from it and you, and you rebound quickly. You know, um, so so I think just not being embarrassed if if you have a hiccup or a speed bump or a complete crash and burn, dude, it happens to all of us. And every entrepreneur I know has had their share of failures, and it's just part of the story. It's part of it. Par it's part of how you get better and better. And uh, you know, do you know anybody that learned how to ski and didn't have a wipeout? Even the best skiers, even at the Olympics, there are. I mean, the, the better you get at the game, the more epic your failures, right? Um, the more, so even at the Olympics, you have people wiping out on the mountain and it's on internationally televised TV. Everybody sees it in real time. You know, there are NFTs that are made of your epic crash and burn. So, so don't worry about it. Shake it off and keep, keep going. You know, that's, that's, I, I think that's the biggest lesson of entrepreneurship. And that's, that's what I admire um, the most really about, about people that are, that are out there um, on their own. It's hard, um, but also, and, and, and you fail, but also the success is that much sweeter, right? Yeah. So great. I mean, we know as entrepreneurs and for the people watching the show, if you're not experiencing roadblocks, if you're not having challenges, it just means you're not pushing hard enough. So welcome those challenges, welcome those roadblocks and embrace them and move on. Like Scotty says, it's great advice. Now, Scotty, I know you're so busy in Washington, changing the world. I mean, you also have an environmental impact approach to what you're doing between the U.S. and Canada. I wanted to just briefly get into that uh, before I eat up so much of the time that you're not going to be able to change the world because I'm taking up too much of your time. So let's talk about that. What's the environmental impact look like between Canada and the U.S.? How is the Canadian American Business Council involved with that as well? Absolutely. Well, you know, the oldest environmental treaties in the world started between Canada and the United States. I mentioned the Columbia River Treaty. There's also, you know, our border between Canada and the United States is mostly water. And water and creatures that live in the water, they don't have passports. 
They don't know which side of the border they're on. And so, you know, we learn a lot actually from original cultures, from First Nations, Aboriginal, and Indigenous people about uh, the way we have to treat our environment. And uh, that's incredibly important. I think businesses, um, some businesses were a little bit slow uh, to the dance on understanding environmentalism and sustainability and responsibility. Some were, some weren't. But, But everybody's there now. Everybody is there. I don't know anybody who, um, you know, is looking to increase their carbon footprint or looking to pollute water. Everybody is trying to do the exact opposite. Uh, and that is uh, incredibly important. It's not even it's not even a debate. It's not controversial. The question is, um, how quickly can you make your transition to sustainability and how robustly can you do it? So um, I think that's really positive. It is something that we work on. Um, and but we also, we do have a business lens. So, you know, there are certain things that we think the markets could actually help solve. I'll give you an example. Everybody who thinks about it, once you focus on it for a minute, is really worried about plastic in water, right? Plastic in oceans, rivers, and streams, it doesn't belong there. And it's, and it's hurting wildlife and it's hurting nature. What, what are the best ways to get plastic out of out of those places. Well, one of the things that we've talked about for years is, and Coca-Cola is part of this conversation, leading it actually is, if you could create a market for recycled plastic, if it had an economic value, you would see people cleaning it up, right? Because they would get something for it. So sometimes uh, you need government incentive, you need government rules of the road, but sometimes if if you can also create a market incentive to do the right thing, that's even better. So we work on things like that as well, Andy. Yeah, I love it. The market incentive makes all the all the sense in the world. I mean, this has been an amazing interview. I mean, what you're doing, uh, obviously, at the Canadian American Business Council is so exciting. And you've got these other things that are just so fun. First of all, let me say the next time you have an, an event in a yurt, I, my wife and I, Kristen, have to come because I don't think I've ever had a dinner in a yurt. So put that on the on the you got uh, it. list of things to do. And what you're doing with this, with with the Canusa Street podcast, I mean, I'm going to listen to the podcast today about the lumber because I'm very fascinated about that. And of course, this North American rebound campaign. I mean, I love that. I mean, we're all rebounding together and you're at the middle of it. So this has been a great interview. I'm so excited to have had you on the show. I was waiting for a number of weeks to get you on, Scotty. Congrats on what you're doing in Washington. And uh, we need more collaboration between the countries now more than ever. And you're in the middle of it. And hopefully, what you're doing uh, at the council between the United States and Canada is um, something that people throughout the world are watching and they say to themselves, you know, we need more cooperation. We need peace. We need love. We need to do things that are powerful for both countries so that both countries can sort of rise up and bring a light to the world. So I wanted to thank you so much for coming on the Dotcom Magazine Entrepreneur Spotlight Series today. Thank you so much, Andy. You know, we are in this together and I love your mantra. It's it's in bright lights above you. Nothing is impossible. I couldn't agree with that more. And it's just a pleasure and an honor to join you today. Thank you so much. 